Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Asset Colloquium today. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not from TIFR, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, Asset Colloquium. Uh, Asset stands for Advances in Science, Engineering, and Technology. This colloquia series usually uh, deal with uh, instrumentation, electronics, detectors, software, uh, medical science, and also uh, many popular science kind of talks arranged. This colloquia, of course, complements uh, the other two colloquia, weekly colloquia that happens in TIFR, one uh, namely natural sciences faculty colloquia that happens on Wednesday and also maths colloquia that happens on Thursday. Uh, so today uh, we are going to have uh, Asset Colloquium to be given by Professor C.S. Unikrishnan. Uh, but before I kind of formally introduce uh, him uh, to especially those of you who are joining from outside, uh, we would like to make uh, a little advertisement for the talk Asset Colloquium that is going to happen on 15th September, that is Tuesday next, at the same time at 4 p.m. This is a special Asset Colloquium uh, in uh, you know, commemorating uh, the Engineers Day. Uh, as you know, Engineers Day uh, is celebrated all over the country, commemorating uh, the birthday of uh, Bharat Ratna Mokshagunda Vishwesraya, one of the uh, most well-known civil engineer or, and many facets, of course, of him in the world. So uh, the colloquium is going to be given by Professor Subhashish uh, Chaudhary who is the director of IIT Bombay, and he is going to speak on machine learning and engineering perspective. So this talk is going to happen on uh, 15th September, Tuesday at 4 p.m. as part of uh, the Engineers Day celebration in TIFR. So uh, that brings us to today's colloquium, as I said, going to be given by Professor Krishnan from Department of High Energy Physics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Is going to speak on enduring echoes from Einstein academic visit to Paris in 1922. Uh, just for especially people who are from outside TIFR, I would like to take a minute to introduce him. Uh, Professor Uni Krishnan's main research interests are both in experimental and theoretical aspects of fundamental issues in gravity and quantum physics. Uh, many of you might remember, I think almost exactly 13 years ago, uh, his lab has, uh, for the first time uh, in India, where uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate was, uh, uh, was produced uh, using the, the laser cooling laboratory that he set up at the IFR. His other major theoretical contributions are the theory of cosmic relativity based on the gravity of the matter in the universe and a universe action mechanics solving the widely debated fundamental problems of quantum mechanics. Uh, Unikrishnan is a proposer scientist of the LIGO India project and a, a member of the LIGO scientific collaboration that detected the gravitational waves. So with these few words, uh, now uh, we will request uh, Professor Unikrishnan uh, to deliver his colloquia. Thanks, Satya. As usual, I want to talk about some history today, but the talk is focused on science, for, for, uh, physics. Uh, I start by remembering a dear colleague who has- Aren't here properly. Govan Sarup. Uh, can you speak a little louder? Or... <clears throat> it's not loud enough. Or maybe come close. Yeah. Can you hear now? Slightly louder, Unni. It's very feeble.
my level is high. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay, right? I think it's fine. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, I try to speak closer. Yeah, I start by remembering our, uh, one of our dear colleagues who has departed. He was truly uh, an asset man in, uh, uh, in the true sense of that uh, word. Uh, now, why am I talking about one of Einstein's visit to Paris? A century after that visit, it's a very important question before we start. During that visit, he was shown a glimpse of the right path for relativity, which was not the path he pioneered and stuck to. The rest is, of course, history, but that history needs to be discussed because we have forgotten that history. The history of physics is an important component of doing physics because one needs to trace the path by which one came to the present, especially if it becomes clear that inappropriate choices have been made in the past. After all, empirical evidence, logic, and history are our only means to go forward. However, the focus of this talk is physics, as discussed during the week-long visit of April 1922. I had written a paper on uh, many aspect of, aspects of this visit and its analysis, discussions, and so on. Uh, the theories of relativity and Bergson philosophy of duration and simultaneity during and after Einstein's 1922 visit to Paris. This is available in the archives. Now, this is a timeline of uh, Einstein and relativity, just a few of the highlights. 1905, the special theory of relativity with Lorentz transformation, time dilation, etc. The same year, he found the general relation between mass and energy. 1907, equivalence principle defining uh, relation between acceleration and gravitation, the starting point of the theory of gravity. 1911, he derived the deflection of light, gravitational, uh, gravitational time dilation, etc. Not in the full theory, uh, a primitive version of it. 1915, he had the full theory of general theory of, uh, general theory of relativity, equations of gravitation and dynamics. 1916, several predictions, including prediction of uh, gravitational waves. And uh, short sale found the solution of gravitational field outside a massive body. 1918, Einstein himself found the cosmological solution with the static universe model. 1919, solar eclipse and the test of the gravitational bending of light. This was a high point in the progression. 1922, he got the Nobel Prize for 1921 for explaining the photographic effect and not for any of these advances which happened between 1905 and 1919 in relativity. Now, between 1914 and 1918, this uh, history of uh, Europe and the world was engulfed in the difficulties related to First World War, as you know. And uh, we see that science has been still going on at some level, even in Europe. Now the visit to Paris from March 10 to April 7th will be discussed in the context of all this. 1918 to 1921, there was good news and bad news for Einstein's academic career. Gravitational bending of light was verified during the 1919 solar eclipse with the mission taken up by Eddington. And it was, it was uh, global news, newspapers celebrated it. As you know, in uh, all, over, all over the world, 
Uh, this is from New York Times, I think. Uh, so Einstein became a household name after this uh, much advertised test. But there were also several difficulties with uh, anti-Semitic attacks on relativity in Germany. He was expecting a Nobel Prize, uh, in fact, uh, pretty desperate for it uh, personally, but uh, he didn't get it in 1920, though the nominations were uh, very strong. In fact, 1920 prize went to Charles Guillaume, who invented the wonder alloy called INVAR uh, with a near zero thermal expansion, special steel and nickel alloy. 1921 prize was deferred. So you had some difficulties around that time. <clears throat> it is at that time, he got this invitation from a friend, a dear friend, Paul Langevin in Paris for a talk, for a series of lectures there. So it's Langevin's letter says, at his last meeting, the Assembly of Professors at the College of France, decided at my proposal to invite you to give this year's series of Michonne lectures held by a foreign scholar in Paris every year. So he also uh, mentioned, I must impress upon you the following reason for a general, of a general sort. The interest of science wants a re-establishment of relations between German speaking scholars and us. And us. Uh, French speaking ones, which has uh, become very bad uh, due to the World War uh, politics, where Germany and France were on opposite sides. And uh, Einstein's reply When I received your kind letter of invitation, I felt great, great and pure joy. And now, one week later, I hesitantly and sadly take up my pen because I cannot accept the invitation now as much as I would personally have liked to. And he gives the re reasons. Uh, I came to the conclusion that at this moment of political tension, my visit to Paris would have been more adverse than favorable consequences. My colleagues here are still being extruded from all international scientific activities. And they are of the opinion that our fellow French professionals are primarily to blame for this. Then he says, people here uh, would perceive a trip by me to Paris at the moment as an act of betrayal and would take such offense that very unpleasant consequence could arise. So he uh, decided not to visit. However, he accepted the visit to visit just after one week. Again, uh, there's a very special reason for it. He says, further reflection on the fortuitous converse, conversation with Rateno. Uh, this is a, uh, a minister uh, of the new Republic, Weimar Republic, Republic. And uh, he was a foreign minister and who was a friend of Einstein. Yeah, Rateno led me to a persuasion that I should have accepted your invitation despite all the reservations mentioned in my letter. Uh, in the endeavor, gradually to repair the harm from this war, one should not allow oneself to be confused by petty considerations. So he decided to go. He said, I, I declare myself willing to come if you have not already chosen another person. Anyway, that's how the visit happened. A full account of this visit is written by uh, Charles Norman, who was an astronomer physicist in Paris. Uh, it's available, English translation is available uh, in, the, in the web. It was a much advertised uh, visit of Einstein in all this context, uh, both in France and Germany. It was also much criticized by the press. Uh, so. Uh, there was uh, polarization. And it was uh, very heavily attended. Uh, it was all over full uh, sessions and public uh, could not uh, get enough seats to come in 
it was regulated by uh, passes by Langeva himself. You can see the crowd outside the Colonel de France waiting to enter, uh, almost like a movie show uh, first day. Now, some of the prominent persons in the events in this discussion, I just wanted to name some of them. Paul Langeva was a well-known physicist and he was, a, he was a host. Charles Norman was science friend, friend, also an admirer. Paul Panleve, he is a mathematician and physicist, French minister, and later French prime minister also, a very accomplished uh, uh, physicist and mathematical physicist. Jack uh, Haramart, uh, well-known name, celestial mechanics uh, person, mathematician. George uh, Sanak, the inventor of the Sanak interferometer, which I will come to later. Alfred Kassler, who, Kassler, who was a student at that time, a Nobel Prize winner later for uh, atomic physics, optical pumping. And uh, Henry Bergson, uh, very well-known philosopher uh, and respected and admired by both scholars and public, Nobel Prize in 1937 for literature. Now, uh, these were uh, talks were arranged by Langeva at the Collège de France and uh, Sorbonne. Now, there is an academy in France, very reputed academy, the sciences, and uh, uh, one might wonder why the academy was not involved in any of this. In fact, uh, I, there was a session arranged there, but Einstein cancelled that session because he got the news that there would be a mass boycott during his address, and he wanted to avoid that embarrassment. He didn't go. The topic of discussion at the College of France and at the Sorbonne, of course, physics, mathematics, geometry, and philosophy. Uh, consequence of general theory of relativity. And uh, much of the discussions were uh, around the notion of time in relativity, the twin uh, paradox, time and simultaneity and so on. Also, also the philosophy of uh, Kant and uh, Ernst Mach was discussed in many occasions. Also, there were incidents where direct attacks on the theory of special relativity happened, uh, by one by George Sarnak, which I will talk to, uh, talk about, and uh, another person called uh, Edward uh, Gildam. Uh, you will notice that this is the same name, Gil Gildam, uh, which I mentioned earlier, Charles Edward uh, Gildam who was the Nobel Prize winner for uh, in, uh, the inventor of INVAR. This Gilliam is a cousin of that Gilliam. One should not, some others confuse between the two, uh, two personalities. Then there's a lasting controversy, which is uh, uh, lasting to this day. This is a Bergson-Einstein affair about which uh, much has been uh, written about. There was a 15 minute debate which happened, uh, which became very, very important later. Now, Einstein gave expository lectures in uh, College of France, summarizing the, the theories of relativity along the lines of his well-known monograph, The Meaning of Relativity, which uh, everybody would have seen. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> though most of the discussion was centered around special theory of relativity, the new and strange aspects of the gravitational fields were discussed in some detail. So let me quickly say what that was. If you look at the Schwarzschild solution for the gravitational metric outside a spherical mass, you know that uh, it has peculiarities. Like uh, uh, right now we talk about black holes and so on, at that, but at that time things were not very clear. The time coordinate is multiplied by a factor square root of 1 minus 2 gm by rc square where R is a radius and mass, M is a mass of the object. And distance is divided by the similar kind of a uh, quantity. Now, as you notice, if uh, is 2 gm by c square R becomes uh, close to 1, then the time stops and the distances 
uh, that uh, that part goes to infinity. So all the people, mathematical physicists were very worried about this situation. So Hadamard uh, asked, if the denominator of that term becomes null, meaning if this term becomes infinite, the formula no longer makes sense, or at least one could demand, what is its physical meaning? So people thought the theory could become invalid and if such things happen in nature. And Einstein did not hide the fact that this profound question is somewhat embarrassing to him. If this term would, could effectively become null somewhere in the universe, then it would be an unimaginable disaster for a theory. And it's very difficult to say a priori what would occur physically because the formula ceases to apply. This is catastrophe which uh, Einstein pleasantly called the Hadamard catastrophe, possible, and in this case, what would be its physical effects. So this was discussed, and uh, people could not come to a conclusion. Even now, you can see that uh, black hole solutions are somewhat of a uh, conceptual difficulty uh, in, uh, in gravitational physics. <laughs> now, uh, there was a direct attack on special relativity, as I mentioned. Uh, this uh, Edward Guillaume uh, was a Swiss uh, physicist, but uh, even more interestingly, he was Einstein's colleague in the patent office. Uh, office. Uh, he was a patent examiner like Einstein for several years. They were colleagues. And uh, he had uh, opinions about physics. He was a, uh, he knew physics well. And uh, so he has. Uh, in the previous days of the uh, visit, uh, the uh, visit of in the uh, in the April visit, most newspapers had published a wire announcing that Mr. Milam, a Swiss physicist, had discovered Blatten calculating mistakes in Einstein theory, and that he intended to reveal them before the public at the College de France. He has been communicating with uh, Einstein before that, uh, back and forth. And Einstein did not agree with his objections. Now he has come to all the way to Paris uh, to uh, expose Einstein. It's a very uh, strange incident, I would say. There's a newspaper report after the fact here. It doesn't say uh, the full report I don't have. Uh, but uh, from the record of uh, Nordman, it says he went up, went up the stage and uh, he had an opportunity to talk there, but after a few moments, it became clear to everyone that this was not going to be the day, nor the individual that would force Einstein to bite the dust. Nobody could understand anything and nobody uh, took it seriously. But there was another attack, which was very, very important, which was of a different kind, which is what I want to uh, talk now. It's, a, it's some remarks made by this person called uh, George, George Sanak. <clears throat> the name is very familiar to you. Uh, Kassler, who was a student, then writes about it from the unforgettable memory of those sessions. Allow me to recall a memory from youth when Paul Langeva had the bold idea to invite Einstein in Paris. The understanding at that time was not without risk because undertaking was not without risk because Einstein was then a professor in Berlin and any German demonstrations could be feared. However, all went fine. Einstein started to give a talk for a general audience about relativity, which we just mentioned. Then he said, there were dramatic moments too. For instance, when old Sanak, the inventor of the ingenious interferometer gave vent to his anger against the theory of relativity on which he put all the blame. The only way was to let that storm die down. Now, Sanak was a uh, well-known experimental researcher. Uh, he published a paper in 1930, more than one, uh, two papers actually, in the title, uh, the English translation, regarding the proof for the existence of a luminiferous either using a rotating interferometer experiment in which he uh, claimed that this experiment shows the existence of the uh, ether and uh, uh, 
Galilean nature of the velocity of the light uh, in this rotating interference experiment. And he describes this interferometer in detail in a sketch in this paper and so on. Now, as you know, this is the interferometer which we now call the SANAC interferometer or optical gyro uh, gyroscope. Uh, the most precise way of measuring rotations is still this cutting and defining instrument. Uh, this is a laser interferometer here, but you can um, active or passive, you can make uh, this rotating interferometers. Now, SANAC logic was very, very simple. Suppose you have a particular length over which propagation of light happens. You want to measure the velocity. The only way is to measure the length and measure the time duration and take the ratio, you get the velocity. Now you need two clocks for doing that. It can be done. But suppose that the velocity is not an invariant, but uh, Galilean, C minus V. Now, if it is a constant, of course, you don't bother whether the frame is moving or not. But if it is not, then it becomes very important whether the frame is moving at some velocity V uh, uh, like that. And then if you want to measure the uh, velocity, you need to measure the length measurement is not an issue, but the time measurement needs these two clocks. And if you are at one point here, you don't know what the time on the other clock is, unless you bring back that information by propagating something back. So there is no way of knowing the time of a clock which is far away, which is, a, which is really the cardinal point of all issues of relativity. Now, assuming that the velocity is C minus V, you can see that the time duration will be more because L by C is the time duration to go from here to there. Now, the, by the time light reaches from one end to other end, the frame has moved extra distance. <clears throat> And you have to add that extra time delay. And you get this extra time delay VL by C square. And this is a thing, but you don't know where it is because of the clocks or because of the propagation. The two cannot be distinguished. The two cannot be separated. And Sanak has the brilliant idea that you don't need to use the two clocks. You could have done that same experiment by bending this particular device bending around, making a loop like this. If you do that, then as the light propagates in the circle and it comes back to the same point in the circle, there is only need for one clock. That was a logic essentially, but this is not the way he presented it. He had a theory, a separate theory because of which he thought this way. Anyway, the Sanagin interferometer or the optical gyroscope today is just a very simple device like this, which can rotate and uh, tell you what the rotation rate is. <clears throat> now, behind all this, you can see that the question is, how does light propagate in, uh, in nature? And uh, Einstein said, there is invariance of the relative speed of light in all inertial frames. Look at what Charles, Charles Nordman write, write in 1922 in the report of Einstein's visit. He says, Einstein's theory is uh, very good. However, there is still something infinitely troubling in the Einsteinian system. The system is admirably coherent, but rests on a particular conception of the propagation of light. How are we to imagine that the propagation of a ray of light could be identical to an observer who flies away from it and for an observer who rushes towards to meet it? If this is possible, it is in any case inconceivable to our customary mentality. And no matter how hard we try, we cannot make the mechanism and nature of that propagation intelligible. It must be confused, con confessed that here lies a mystery which eludes us. The whole Einsteinian synthesis, as coherent as it is, rests on a mystery exactly like the revealed religions. This is an admirer of Einstein writing about it. Now, this is exactly what Sanak was uh, attacking. But uh, what happened? Uh, there is a record from 
some other person who attended uh, some of these lectures, uh, J.P. Pomi, a physicist and a, a writer, he says about the Sarnak incident, what was the attitude there? Did one acclaim the Frenchman? No. At first, it was a scandal because of the violence of the intervention. Apparently, Sarnak was very agitated. Mr. Einstein was quite disconcerted. Perhaps he expected a fight on political grounds, but this brutal attack on scientific grounds flustered him. Fortunately, he was made to understand that the best was to reply nothing. At any rate, Mr. Sarnak spoke very fast. At any rate, his address sounded like a manifesto, for he did not do what was needed to make him understood, unfortunately, I suppose. He saw himself as facing irreducible adversaries. Anyway, uh, it says the attendants let the storm pass. And when he at last took his seat, the discussion started again as if his communication had never happened. But that outburst was totally unfit to induce any exchange of useful, useful observations. So that is what happened. Unfortunate for Sanak, uh, because uh, several years, uh, three years later, Michelson published a paper in Astrophysical Journal, April 1935. It says, the effect of Earth's rotation on the velocity of light. This is the same Michelson who did the michelson morley experiment. It says, the theory of the effect of the rotation of the Earth on the velocity of, was de, of light was derived on the hypothesis that of a fixed ether. In fact, he says this was already done in 1905, but the experiment could be done only later. So I, Michelson here talks about an experiment to detect the velocity, the change in the velocity of light in a rotating frame, assuming the hypothesis of a fix either. And the same journal, same year, he published this result of the experiment. It's a heroic experiment because he had to use a evacuated interferometer one mile in length, in arm length. It is a, on the scale of the same, same scale as the gravitational wave detectors of today, uh, more than a kilometer sized interferometer which he operated in 1925. There was no laser and all that, a very difficult experiment, but he did the experiment. The, this is the result of the experiment. What was the result? He found that the velocity of light is retarded in the direction of the rotation. It says the beam traveling, traversing the rectangle in the counterclockwise direction was retarded. Observed displacement of the fringes was found to be 0.23, agreeing with the computed value 0.236 within the limits of experimental error. Of course, uh, nobody talks about these kind of experiments. People are probably even people who teach and learn special relativity and so on are probably not even aware of these important experiments. I don't want to talk about more about this, but I wanted to set this history in the right uh, context. Uh, uh, unfortunately for Sarnak, uh, there was no uh, discussion of all this together later. Now, again, going back to the discussions, uh, another point from Alfred Kassler. And there were difficult moments too, when great mathematician Paul Panleve, talking about the adventure of the two friends, the one who stayed in a place and the one who left by train and came back. You know, this is about the twin paradox. There were a lot of heated discussions, heated but friendly discussions uh, when in, during Einstein's one week visit because this was the uh, uh, same point on which he was criticized heavily in Germany uh, by several people before that. And uh, Castle says, Pan Lewe refused obstinately to understand why the latter had remained younger than the first one. So let's go back to that because Einstein had an answer. Einstein had an answer in that uh, debate and Einstein had an answer before that in print. So I want to mention both. 
it was langema himself who introduced the twin paradox and that too in a uh, conference on philosophy in bologna in 1911 and many philosophers were jolted into a discussion about the multitude of times in the physical world one each and one so on for every inertial observer so he uh, langema in that uh, talk he said for this it is sufficient that our traveler consents to be locked in a projectile that would be launched from earth with a velocity sufficiently close to that of light returned to earth he has aged two years then he leaves his ark and finds that the world has 200 years older if his velocity remained in the range of only 120000 less than the velocity of light and he also made a arbitrary statement which is not part of special relativity one who has aged the least is the one who had suffered the greatest accelerations now we all know that a clock that moves relatively ages more slowly time dilation in theories of relativity is well known clocks in einstein special relativity says if a clock is taken and uh, um, passed around and uh, brought back after some uh, uh, some transport it will be it will have time dilation and this is a formula which is given the formula the clock at the uh, which remained at rest and related to the clock which is traveled is by this particular formula so there is time dilation because the time in this clock is reduced by this particular factor now this dt can be divided into small sections in a in a differential sense and they can be all added up or integrated to get the final time dilation so the uh, simplest uh, conclusion is that every transporter clock runs slower that is a uh, that's a very definitive conclusion in special relativity transporter clocks always run slower but the problem in relativity special relativity is it's a symmetric theory how do you decide which is a transporter clock because in from the reference frame of one clock the other clock is relatively moving but when you change the frame it is reciprocal and in 1922 nothing was known experimentally about time dilation one should keep in mind that now it is very easy to talk about these things pointing to experiments but in 1922 nothing was known experimentally about time dilation now the first paper probably on time dilation was about homi baba this is a paper his paper on uh, what he called the u particle which he wanted to identify with what was what was called the heavy electrons in those days now we know this u particles are mu mesons so this is a paper of uh, uh, omi bhava in nature 1937 on nuclear forces heavy electrons and beta decay where if he, he publishes a theory in uh, analogy with the uh, yukawa's theory which he says these particles will disintegrate into a positive electron and a neutrino this disintegration being spontaneous the u particle may be described as a clock and hence it follows merely from considerations of relativity the time of disintegration is longer when the particle is in motion we believe that this may have to do with the fact observed by blackett and others that below 2 to the 8 electron volts most cosmic ray particles are electrons above this energy they are heavy electrons and very clear but the pro- experiment was done by rossi and hall later few years later where they probably they did not they were not aware of baba's paper on mu mesons now uh, in relativity uh, the twin paradox is known to everybody the problem is it's a symmetric theory so if you have two clocks and uh, if one clock is moving relatively and it is brought back you will think that that clock has time dilation but relative to the other clock it is the it is the it is this clock which goes 
and comes back kinematically. So it should, uh, it is this clock, it is this clock which should have the time relation relative to the other clock. So this is a completely symmetric situation in special relativity. That is a, that's a problem. Since it's a symmetric reciprocal situation, how do you decide which clock runs slower? If you do, if you draw a space-time diagram for each of the situation in the in the frame of the first clock, you, you, the other clock goes through a particular trajectory and comes back. But equally uh, truly, in the frame of the other clock, you have exactly reciprocal diagram with the motion of the clock reversed. The only difference is possibly that in one frame. For a brief moment, there is a force you can uh, experience because of the acceleration. Otherwise, the uh, uh, space-time diagrams are completely uh, identical. From the space-time diagrams, you cannot determine which clock is running slower, contrary to everything which is said in textbook. In fact, almost all discussions and textbooks dismiss this paradox and make the statement that the problem is solved within the special theory of relativity alone. Teachers teach this claim, which they cannot prove, to generations of students, unfortunately. However, uh, why am I saying this? We can look at what was Einstein's own resolution of twin paradoxes. This is not what is uh, discussed in textbook. Einstein must have had a view on twin paradox, right? It, so he was, he was forced to talk about his solution of twin paradox in these debates. And there's a history to it. Einstein had published a paper in 1980 about twin paradox. That's the only thing he wrote about twin paradox. It was written in the form of a dialogue. It says dialogue about, uh, dialogue about objections to the theory of relativity. Uh, English translation it goes like this. It's about a critic confronting a relativist. He says, people like me have quite often expressed their view, various doubts about the theory of relativity in journals, but rarely has one of your relativists responded. And Shane is writing this paper in a self-critical manner. So he says, rarely one of your relativists has responded. And he also says, I've come to you personally in order to make it impossible for you to shirk it as it has happened before. So Einstein was well aware that he did not answer the criticisms. What was his resolution? His published resolution rejects all the resolutions you see in most textbooks on special relativity. Einstein admitted that the special theory of relativity time dilation is symmetric between the two clocks. Then he used the gravitational time dilation in general theory of relativity to such a solution. So he said, special relativity is not enough. You need general theory of relativity to solve this problem. Though he didn't calculate the solution in that particular paper, this is a solution he suggested. Uh, I have written a paper about this, analyzing what his solution was, doing a calculation about it and so on, in current science in the centenary year. You can go back and look at it. I don't want to go into details of the solution. I don't know what I wanted to uh, notice here was it was amusing to for me to note that Einstein chose not to mention the gravitational resolution in the debates in Paris, possibly fearing that people will interpret it as the correctness of the anti-relativity campaign which was going on in uh, Germany, because there he was trying to say that special relativity was enough in the early days. So there is an interesting incident here. I have not studied it, studied it further. Now, the uh, another main point uh, we wanted to discuss today about si time and simultaneity, there's a lasting controversy. And that's why I talked about the echoes, which you can, you can hear even, even today. A discussion was arranged by the French Physical Society, Philosophical Society uh, at the Sorbonne University. Uh, this was a day before the visit ended. And uh, in the introduction, 
to that uh, session, the president of the society, French Philosophical Society, mentioned, introduced. He said, during the fourth International Congress in Bologna, Langevin revealed the mysteries of the restricted theory, uh, special theory of relativity, to astonished but singularly captivated philosophers. In October, as an apostle of new evangelism, new evangel, he expounded again, under a slightly different form, the discoveries of Mishra Einstein in front of the members of the French Society of Philosophy. And at some stage in the discussion, a lot of things were discussed, including uh, uh, Kantian philosophy, Machian philosophy, various other aspects, uh, role of uh, geometry, uh, mathematics in physics and so on. At some stage in the discussion, Henry Bergson, who was present there, was requested to speak about his opinion about time. And Bergson said, I came here to listen. I did not intend to speak, but I will yield to the kind insistence of the Society of Philosophy. Now, Bergson was also a speaker in the Bologna conference we mentioned 1911, but he was talking about philosophy there on philosophical intuition. He was the top philosopher of those times. Now, the 1922 visit attracted the attention of historians because of short discussion between Einstein and Henry, Henry Bergson in the discussion session at the Sorbonne. Uh, he was a professor of philosophy at the College of France. As I said, he was a Nobel Prize uh, for literature in 1937. He wrote a book called Duration and Simultaneity with reference to Einstein's theory in 1922 itself. So he was studying time in relativity. And Bergson commented briefly on Einstein's theory during, the, during this uh, session. And he had criticisms to make. And the criticisms became, he had, it had some role to play. Uh, probably, uh, it had, I, uh, one, uh, one even speculates sometimes that the criticism se seems to imply severe personal consequence for Einstein. What happened was, if you uh, check the 1921 Nobel Prize presentation speech by uh, Arrhenius, which was given in 1922 December, says, there is probably no physicist living today whose name has become so widely known as that of Albert Einstein. Most discussion centers on his theory of relativity. Then he says, it will be no secret that the famous philosopher Bergson in Paris has challenged his theory, while other philosophers have acclaimed it wholeheartedly. Then he says, third group of studies for which in particular Einstein has received the Nobel Prize falls within the domain of quantum theory founded by Planck, the photoelectric effect and so on. So the criticisms, not only this, but various others um, ha had played a crucial role in uh, why Einstein did not get a Nobel Prize for the discoveries in relativity. <laughs> so Bergson's critic of Einstein theory is the most discussed event of the visit by historians. A lot has been written. And uh, if you are interested, uh, one can look at this uh, recent book, The Physicist and the Philosopher by Jimena Canales. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very recent book with a lot of details, maybe too many details. Now, Henry Bergson as a person, he was a top mathematics student as an undergraduate, but uh, shifted and graduated in philosophy. He wrote many widely read monographs in philosophy of being in the physical world. A very deep work on time, duration, and simultaneity. You can see a list of uh, several books, uh, which is all available. Now, physical time and psychological intuition, uh, psychological time. Uh, if you look uh, in the 19th century, what was the picture of these. You can see that physical time was absolute and universal, identical for everybody. Notion of simultaneous occurrence of two or more events was also an absolute 
in the sense it's the same for everybody, universal. There was intuitive mapping from physical time to individual's time with no conflict with common sense. There was no conflict between physics and common sense in 19th century. So Bergson says in 1922, common sense believes in a unique time, the same for all beings and all things. The idea of a universal time common to uh, conscious being and to things is a simple hypothesis. Now, there is clash between the new physics of relativity and philosophy, obviously, because uh, in, in, in uh, early relativity, Lorentz relativity, either was a necessity, but which could not be detected as Michelson's experiment showed. Thus, for the first time, physical time became a multitude of times. There were time dilation, which depends on velocity relative to either. So it was different for different individuals moving at different speeds, depending on their speed. However, nobody could uh, detect their motion relative to either. So this was a severe problem for philosophy. Motion related to either cannot be detected. And Lorentz relativity has a multitude of real times based on real motion related to one master frame. But if nobody could detect this motion, there is no way to map the motion and its time. And Bergson must have been relieved when Einstein's theory came and effaced the Lorentz Poincaré theory. Because in Einstein's theory, there is no preferred frame, there is no absolute frame. And the time dilation is a relative coordinate kinematical effect. Since Einstein time dilation depends on relative motion and the speed of separation, not motion, it's speed of only separation, relative motion. It is symmetrical between two observers. Anybody can claim a state of rest and then the other person is in motion. This, there is multitude of times, but they are all equivalent. So there, are, there is different time for different people, but they are all equivalent. Therefore, Bergson interpreted time in special relativity as mere mathematical type with kinematical multiplicity. Then the notion of absolute time and simultaneity are not affected in reality because Bergson thought these times are not real. So at the session in Sorbonne, Bergson started his comments by expressing his admiration for Einstein theory which was new physics and in some respects, new way of thinking. Then he stated the issue of contention. Common sense believes in unique time, the same for all beings and all things. The idea of universal time, common to conscious beings and to things. The simple hypothesis. But it's a hypothesis that I believe to be founded on which and which in my opinion contains nothing incompatible with the theory of relativity. I cannot undertake to demonstrate this link. It would be necessary to take the terms which enter the Lorentz equation one by one and search for their concrete significance, which he does in his book. Then one would finally find that the multiple times the theory of relativity deals with are far from being able to pretend the same degree of reality. It's a severe criticism of special relativity. But all that I cannot establish as regards time in general, I seek your permission to do, or at least glimpse for the specific case of simultaneity. Simultaneity. Here we will see easily that the relativistic point of view does not ex exclude the intuitive point of view and even necessarily implies it. So he uh, wanted to just find uh, what extent this uh, relativity renounces intuition and to what extent it remains attached to it. And I'm seeing about this dismissive actually. He summarized what he thought were points raised by Merton uh, and concluded, the question is therefore the following, is the time of the philosopher the same as one of the physicists, one of physicists? And finally answered, there is no time, not a time for time of philosophers. There's only a psychological time different from the time of the physics. So let's look at this particular question of issue of simultaneity. I will talk about more, uh, in a more detailed fashion next week 
in the NSF colloquium. But here I want to give just an uh, intuitive idea. Einstein said in his book, Relativity, the Special and General Theory, he said, we require a definition of simultaneity such that this definition supplies us with the method by means of which one can decide by experiment whether or not both the lightning strokes occurred simultaneously. So there are two events happening, two lightning strokes at two different places, A and B. How do you decide whether they are simultaneous? And he had a particular example in the, this book, which is a popular uh, physics book. Everybody would have seen this book. So he asked, are two events, example, two ex uh, lightning strokes at A and B, which are simultaneous with reference to the railway embankment, also simultaneous related to, related to the train. So he is considering a railway platform and a train which is moving related to it, two observers M and M prime at the midpoints of the platform and at the in the train. And they coincide at that some particular point, which which is which happened to be the time at which these two lightning strokes happen. The question is, if one of them sees simultaneously, what does the other observer perceive? The simple question, we should be able to answer that. Now, the question of deciding simultaneously is actually a very subtle question in the theory of relativity. For example, here you have, there's an observer at the midpoint of a frame, which is a stationary frame. You know that it is stationary, in, it's a rest frame of the observer. And there are these clocks, and there are two events which happen at point A and point B. Then two light signals come to the person simultaneously. They arrive at the midpoint simultaneously. Can you decide whether these events happened also simultaneously? One would say yes, because we know this is a frame at rest. Similarly, if two light signals are sent from here outwards, can you decide whether they reach the endpoints at the same time if you are at the midpoint and if the, if the frame is stationary? One would say yes, within the special theory of relativity because the rest frame and the velocity of light is a constant in both directions. However, you realize that if the frame is moving, we cannot answer this question really unless we assume something about the propagation of light. In moving frame, Simultaneously defined in terms of coincidence with a local clock depends on the assumption about the propagation of the messenger waves. It's a, it depends on the convention. For example, let, just look at the case of sound. Two alarm clocks are going off simultaneously. Somebody is at the midpoint, stationary. We know intuitively and from experiments that the sound will reach simultaneously at the observer. So simultaneously is very clear here. Whereas in the, in the frame of a moving person, in the rest frame of a moving person, what happens? In the rest frame, the velocity of sound is more from one direction than from the other direction because velocity of sound depends on the motion of the observer. So in the, such a case, one signal will reach first and then the other signal will reach. So there is no simultaneity. So we immediately see that for the case of sound, which is a Galilean wave, where the velocity is not a constant. If the events are simultaneous for one observer, they are not simultaneous for another moving observer. It's very clear. Therefore, So the point is, the two dis dis distant events judged as simultaneous by one observer will be perceived as successive by another observer when the relative velocity of messenger waves is Galilean, like right, sound. However, if the velocity of the waves were an invariant constant, suppose the velocity of sound was also a constant, then this conclusion should change. Then two events simultaneous two events which are simultaneous to one would have been simultaneous for the other also. Let's see that. So we can answer Einstein's question, are two events which are simultaneous with reference to the railway embankment also simultaneous relative to the train? 
assuming that the velocity of light is an invariant constant, because that is what Einstein assumed. To a person at the midpoint here, of course, the signals arrive simultaneously. But to a person who is moving also, the velocity from the one direction is exactly the same as the velocity from the other direction. This is a person in the rest frame. The sources are moving. In the rest frame of this person, the sources will move. But the velocity of light does not depend on the velocity of the source. So therefore, these two signals will again come simultaneously. So if the velocity of sound, if the velocity of light is invariant in all frames, simultaneity for one person is also simultaneity for another person. This is what Bergson was talking about. It's clear that the apparent relativity of simultaneity is a Galilean experience. Simultaneity is universal if the velo relative velocity of light is an invariant constant. But Einstein concluded in his book, which you can go back and read, it's very interesting. And it's ununderstandable why he concluded like this. He concluded, observers who take the railway train as a reference body must therefore come to the conclusion that the lightning flash took flash B took place earlier than the lightning flash A. We thus arrive at the important result. Events which are simultaneous with respect to, with reference to the embankment are not simultaneous with respect to the train and vice versa. Relativity of simultaneous, simul, simultaneity. So he inadvertently used Galilean light to arrive at this conclusion. He, has, uh, he was analyzing the theory as, after assuming that the velocity of light was invariant. But during the analysis, he forgot that and use Galilean light to make a conclusion. The relativity of simultaneity, therefore, is inconsistent with the invariant relative velocity of light. These two are inconsistent. Thus, a fatal error in the formulation of special relativity that renders the theory inconsistent was made by Einstein. Anybody can read his writing and verify this. This was what Henry Bergson pointed out, pointed to in the discussion at Sorbonne and wrote about his book, wrote about it in his book, Duration and Simultaneity, very, very clearly. Let's look at this passage. He says, he repeats Einstein's analysis of the train and uh, platform example in detail in book. And then he says, this passage enables us to catch on the wing an ambiguity that's, that has been the cause of a good many misunderstanding. We must not forget that the train and the track are in a state of reciprocal motion. They are in relative motion. As in special relativity, everything, there is no absolute motion. Let us now emit our two flashes of lightning. The point from which they set out no more belongs to the ground than to the train. The waves advance independently of the motion of the, their source. That's a fundamental assumption in special relativity. It then becomes clear, it becomes evident at once the two systems are interchangeable and that exactly the same thing will occur at M prime as at the corresponding point M. If M is at the mid midpoint of AB platform and if it is at M, we perceive simultaneity on the track. It is at M prime, the middle of B prime A prime, which is the mid midpoint of the train. We shall perceive the same simultaneity in the train. What is simultaneity with respect to the track is simultaneity with respect, respect to the train, which is what the conclusion we arrived at using simple high school logic. There is no complexity in that logic, uh, which we already see, which is what Bergson was saying already in 1922. And contrast is with Einstein's incorrect deduction. Observers who take the railway train as their reference body must therefore come to the conclusion that the lighting flash B took place earlier than the lightning flash A. We thus arrive at the important result, relativity of simultaneity. So there is a clear conflict here. And we already saw from a simple analysis that it is Bergson's conclusion. We also came to uh, from simple logic. Bergson's logic was impeccable. However, many attacks Bergson 
on Einstein's behalf later in writing, Jean Becker, Andre Mertz, and so on. Einstein himself ridiculed Bergson in private, but never wrote anything in reply directly. Yet it is known that Einstein got a copy of the book and read it. Uh, it's interesting. Anybody can read Einstein's Relativity, the Special and General Theory. It's a popular physics book. Or you can read his uh, Relativity paper itself and confirm Einstein's fatal error and Bergson's impeccable logical refutation. Then the significance of this experimental observations of Sanak and Michelson come to the fore because those experiments also highlight the same point that there is no uh, the relative velocity of light being an invariant and the fact that there is lack of universality and simultaneity, they are in conflict. Empirical evidence, logic and history are our only means to go forward. We should never undermine them in favor of scriptures. So I want to end this talk with a, with a quotation from Einstein himself. It says, the theoretical scientific researcher is not to be envied because nature, or more precisely put, experiment, is a merciless and not very kindly judge of his efforts. She never says yes to a theory, in the best case, merely perhaps, but in most cases, simply no. If an experiment agrees with the theory, it means perhaps. If it does not agree, then it means no. Every theory is sure to experience its no someday. Most theories already do so after their formulation. It's just that uh, now it is a receiving time for Einstein's theory. I again uh, point to this reference where some of these things are discussed. And I will uh, discuss simultaneity, synchronization of atomic clocks, and so on from a thoroughly physics point of view next week again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vani. Thank you very much for your excellent colloquia. Uh, I think there are some questions. Uh, okay, I, I don't see any more any questions right now on uh, Zoom. Uh, so people who have questions on Zoom, please uh, either raise your hand or you can of course simultaneously unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, but let me take one question from YouTube. Meanwhile, uh, this is Abhinav Chaudhary. Uh, he says, "Is the constant C of the speed of light dictated by special relativity?" and invalidated by the expansion of the universe? No. See, special theory of relativity, it has a postulate of the invariance of the relative velocity of light. It's a postulate. Uh, in many textbooks uh, very naively say, uh, michelson morley experiment shows that there is no either and the velocity of light is a constant. You already saw during this talk, Michelson himself published a paper in 1925 contradicting this fact. Uh, at least Michelson should, Michelson should have known whether his experiment is uh, proving velocity of light being invariant or not. So uh, it's just a hypothesis in a theory. Uh, the expansion of the universe uh, is a completed, it has nothing to do with the velocity of light, right? Uh, there is no uh, no observation regarding the expansion of the universe which contradicts the velocity of light being different from C because universe is an absolute kind of a frame. It is a single frame. If you stand in a single frame and do the observations, you cannot say anything about velocity dependence of the uh, relative velocity of light. Uh, velocity dependence means the dependence, dependence on the velocity of the observing frame, because all observations are done in the same uh, single reference frame of the universe. So the two are different, uh, uh, different ideas, uh, different uh, instances. Uh, another question from the same participant is: said, does quantum uncertainty apply in relativistic effect? No, I didn't understand the 
Yeah, I, let me read. Uh, does quantum uncertainty apply in relativistic effects? Yeah, it's. No, no. Can uh, Abhinav, can you retype your question more uh, clearly? Yeah, I will take up uh, once again. It's very interesting for me that the, our physics colleagues have no questions at all. It's very interesting because it's exactly the same repetition of history where people don't debate anything which is serious. When they see, they, they just hide behind the scriptures. <laughs> no, you, you do have a question right away. Uh, this is from Professor Tatar. Only my question is related to the, uh, the detector that is used to detect gravitational waves. Yes. A principle that is also a, a Michelson Morley interferometer on a much bigger scale exactly. than the one that Michelson used in 1925. Yes. So what does that no, say? No, is there Michelson. any way of uh, using that to uh, you know either verify uh, Michelson's yeah. uh, so, or uh, go against it? I will answer that. See, uh, Michelson, uh, the Michelson Morley interferometer which Michelson used uh, in 1887 is different from the Michelson interferometer which he used in 1925. Uh, in 1925, he was trying to measure the uh, effect of on the relative velocity of light, effect of the rotation of the Earth. For, for that experiment, what he set up was a rectangular interferometer in which light goes in both directions exactly as Sanak did. So what Michelson set up, Michelson and Gale experiment, was a interferometer, which is an exact analog of Sanak interferometer. The only difference between the two experiments is Sanak rotated his interferometer in the laboratory, whereas Michelson relied on the Earth's rotation to measure the same effect. Of course, Michelson experiment was very difficult to do because Earth's rotation is very, very slow. But he could measure Earth's rotation relative to what he interpreted as a stationary ether in his experiment. He did measure and he found that to uh, interpret this result, he has to say that the velocity of light, relative velocity of light in one direction is retarded uh, relative to the value C. Now, when you come to gravitational wave detectors, they are Michelson interferometers, but they are locked uh, with uh, a feedback for low frequency, especially at DC. So it cannot detect anything at a slow, uh, its bandwidth, detectable bandwidth is from about 20, 30 hertz to high uh, kilohertz. And it is essentially insensitive to any signal which is uh, very low frequency. Because it has a diurnal uh, you know, time scale, is it? Okay. Yeah, but uh, but it can be used for a uh, for an experiment by looking at very short time scale uh, rotation. It is possible, but uh, the p uh, precision will not be as much as you can achieve in laboratory with uh, dedicated instruments. Uh -huh. uh, Puni, uh, this. Uh, in the YQ, uh, in the YouTube, uh, the participant has retyped. Let me read out for you if uh, you could comprehend that. Uh, so my question is, while at human level of observation, the uncertainty in particle velocity or position is extremely negligible, wouldn't these uncertainties have fundamental effects at the relativistic frames of references? No, you know, uh, there, is a, there is an interface between quantum mechanics and uh, uh, relativistic effects. And this is dealt with in uh, relativistic uh, uh, quantum mechanics, you know, developed by Dirac and so on. So there is an interaction, but uh, that is not relevant for our topic today. Here we are talking about uh, uh, you know, just uh, everyday situations, and, uh, classical situations where light propagates over large distances. We are talking about clocks, classical clocks, atomic clocks, and so on, and the simultaneity of such events. If you are uh, mean simultaneity of quantum mechanical events where uh, we have to consider the small uncertainties in time and so on, that's a 
different matter uh, that has to be discussed uh, completely in a separate context. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess there are no more questions. So, okay, Uni, uh, I think yeah. I, I don't no, see any more. It, uh, it still surprises me that uh, uh, a very important issue, uh, you know, in this particular illustrious institute of research, no discussion. <laughs> you have... Uh, I see Challenger Singh, uh, T.P. Uh, Singh. Uh, T.P., hey, yeah. Singh. T.P., can you go? Uh, yeah. I, since you, have, you say we should have a discussion, I really appreciate your talk. I'm trying to understand something. So uh, are you saying that special relativity is correct? But on this issue of simultaneity, Bergson was right and Einstein made a mistake. So is that the inference or are we going beyond that and saying that we must give up special relativity? I'm trying to understand your conclusion. Obviously, it, one has to go beyond. What did, see, let us see what Bergson said. Without simultaneity, one cannot have a first order term in Lorentz transformation. The minus Vx by C square comes from exactly this simultaneity issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bergson, what Bergson mm -hmm. says is that term, mm -hmm. that term is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's very clear that Einstein made an error in that argument. That That is very clear. So no, it is very, also I very clear I that... Uh, I to understand implications. No, that will come to. That's what I'm saying. So first one has to see that Einstein was in error and Bergson was right regarding mm -hmm. simultaneity and the first order uh, Vx by C square term in Lorentz transformation. Once you mm -hmm. see that, you can mm -hmm. also see that many other things go wrong. What is a primary thing which goes wrong? That the hypothesis that the relative velocity of light is an invariant constant in all inertial frames. That goes wrong. Mm -hmm. That is, so then it goes, then the theory collapses. So, there has to be another theory of relativity, mm -hmm. which so the, gives you... Uh, that my other question is that, uh, so just from my understanding, suppose there was a absolute universal time, a second time, not the time of space-time, this four-dimensional space-time. And so to say, you might call it a fifth dimension for which maybe there is some evidence. That time is absolute. Would that help matters? I want, what I want to do, I, I know, I know, yeah, you, yeah. I know that uh, it helps you to uh, mm. talk about your quantum mechanics, but mm -hmm. here, here that there is, is not uh, the issue, is it? Yeah, here, uh, there is no more time allowed. This is the only dimension which is allowed within the Bergsonian philosophy. Yeah, but and, suppose suppose I, I want to extend it. Suppose I give you a hypothesis like in non commutative geometry there is an additional time parameter present in addition to four-dimensional space-time. You will be responsible for all the consequences of this. No, that is okay, Uni. I'm trying to, I'm trying to save Einstein from Bergson or whichever way you want to You put. cannot, you cannot. So you would give up special relativity entirely, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there is experimental evidence for it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I don't, I have not never understood this properly. Maybe you are right. No, I'm not, the I'm reason is, to understand. See, TP, this one I have to say it very clearly. The reason mm -hmm. why people don't understand it is because only because people don't look at it. That's the only reason. These are very, very I simple see, things. The yeah. logic is simple. The experiment yeah. is simple. You mm -hmm. can see the Sinak experiment, the Michelson experiment, Michelson Gale experiment. They're all very simple experiments. Bergson's argument. Extremely simple logic. Hmm. You, you don't need anything more than undergraduate education to understand these things. And still, still people don't look at it because of the weight of the scriptures. That, yeah, may be true. I'm not contesting that. That's the reason. Um, nah, yeah, I, say, I must say I have I've also not understood properly what exactly is going on. Maybe you are right. I am not contesting you. <laughs> no, no, it's not a question of I think it is finally a question of discussion. See, look at how how interesting, especially this event itself was. Mm -hmm. uh, people were willing to discuss 
people were uh, disagreeing with many of things but it was a very friendly discussion going on mm-hmm. and the sole aim was mm-hmm. to settle mm-hmm. issues in physics mathematics and philosophy yes, they even yes. gave an opportunity for a uh, for uh, edward gillam mm-hmm. to come back come from all the way from mm-hmm. uh, switzerland and mm-hmm. uh, say bad things about einstein theory there mm-hmm. but uh, uh, now such things don't happen which is very unfortunate yeah so now because of other evidence i would like to still try to save special relativity and yet have bergson correct <laughs> see the, that is why i showed i ended this this uh, uh, the stock with this particular uh, mm. quotation from einstein mm. if one experiment if one experiment says no mm. then the theory should go that's what he says if an exp- mm-hmm. if an experiment agrees with theory it means perhaps if it does not agree then it mm. means no there are no saving there mm. and he also says every theory is sure to experience its no some day mm. <laughs> interesting okay pp uh Uh, no can uh, i can I, i i need to think i need to think i appreciate what runni is saying uh, i mean i he is right about strict scriptures completely i we are <laughs> on the same side on that point so yeah thank you okay runni uh, there is a question on the uh, chat in the zoom if you can see and the question is uh, if we send two pulses from each source wouldn't be uh, wouldn't we be able to distinguish Uh, can you read this question uh, i think you should be able to see on your screen as well uh, yes, i see that yeah. it's okay i try no uh, uh, let me quickly no uh, let me just quickly see here there are two sources from which uh, to the light is coming now all one can say in this kind of situation is whether do through pulses have reached us simultaneously but we can never say whether it came from two events which happened simultaneously because those two events are happening at a distance even 1 meter away right so these two pulses there is no way to control these two pulses to emit pulses of light at the same time because to do that you have to send a signal to those two sources from a common point then we cannot know when those two pulses reach those two uh, sources when the light returns back any evidence of the known invariance of the velocity of light it gets erased because one is positive and the other is negative so all one can say which is very strictly adhered to both by uh, you know as uh, whenever einstein wrote about it he was very clear about it whenever poincare uh, wrote about it he was very clear about it one should understand the only thing one can judge is a simultaneity at the same point as as observer local simultaneity there one can decide whether two events have come simultaneously to the same point where there is a clock we cannot say anything about uh, distant events unless we make assumptions that we are at the midpoint the prime is not moving it is an absolute uh, stationary the velocity of light is constant it is same from both sides all those assumptions go into deciding the simultaneity of two events which are not local it's a very extremely subtle issue okay so uh so ni i uh, would like to uh, thank you for very very nice uh, talk and also you said that this is going to be followed up uh, by another one in the, on wednesday yeah, i, so I think sure. uh, people uh, will now just run away <laughs> <on the laughs> second talk <laughs> i'm sure no who wants to take 
and uh, so thank you very much before uh, we uh, say bye i would like once again uh, remind all of you uh, about the engineers day special asset colloquium on 15th uh, that is on tuesday at four o'clock by uh, professor subhash chaudhary uh, the director of iit bombay so with that thank you very much all of you uh, good night thank you